Thank you, Steffi. Picture the scene. I was sitting with a recently elected senior government official in a country where less than half the population were online, but where elections technology and a social media monitoring system had just played an instrumental role in a historic changeover of power. A new government had arrived, conscious that the popular vote had played a major role in deciding the overall result, and the effect was palpable in the corridors of power. He drew closer to me and said, "Look, Clara, there's this hashtag that masses of people are using, and they're demanding that we publish our budgets. What should we do?" We've all had those moments when we're struck by the power of technology to disrupt. That was mine. A year or so later, that government official published his budget in full for the very first time. With the current pace of change, these moments are happening every day, in every sector, in every country. We all know tech offers incredible promise, whilst it also creates serious new challenges. But I worry we're wasting this potential and ignoring the warning signs. I question whether many of you devote as much energy to the inclusion and protection of your users as you do to your branding and marketing. I question whether you fully explore the ethics of your decisions, the consequences of your mission statements, and the intention of your design approaches. I worry whether we hold our privileges sufficiently in check because we must, and I think we can do better. But let me go back a few steps. I've spent the last 10 years working in the international development sector, inspired at a young age by political activists challenging the status quo and imagining a better future for their countries. I wanted to support their fight, however I could. I've worked with reform champions in government and civil society to improve how the decisions which affect citizens are made, including big ones like elections, and how services are provided. What can broadly be called the field of governance. I've lived and worked for multiple years in Nigeria and the Democratic Republic of Congo, with shorter projects elsewhere, from Guinea-Bissau to Pakistan. However, it was seeing the effect that digital tech was having in the countries I was living in and the governance programs I was working on that pushed me to move into the growing digital and innovation space in the international development sector. Steffi met me as I was in the midst of this transition. After a glass or two of wine,、uh, we happened to be working, walking together one cold London night, and whether it was the wine or Steffi's disarming way of putting you at ease, I shared at length my aspirations and frustrations. What struck me, I explained, as an interloper into this tech world, was that whilst there was huge creativity, immense intelligence, and considerable finance, it often felt that this was being channeled in an incredibly insular way. Products offering endless self-improvement to a certain geographic and socio-economic group, with a very unhealthy and unchallenged optimism bias, and where the trade of privacy for convenience was being taken to its furthest conclusion, I found myself asking over and over again, "What are you adding? What are you adding in terms of the issues that you're addressing? What are you adding in terms of who you're targeting?" What are you adding in terms of how you're shaping the tech sector and the future of the world we live in? And like that, the theme for this conference was born. So let me try and set out my reflections again for you today, with perhaps a little more refinement and this time completely sober. The first dimension of what are you adding is adding for what? We know that digital technology has the power to transform and disrupt our politics, economies, and societies. We're seeing it happen all around us. We should also know that these technologies transcend country boundaries, and that something designed with benign intent in one country can wreak havoc when applied in another. Take Facebook. Ostensibly designed to connect people, but whose platform was deemed to have played a determining role in fueling hate speech, during, which was linked to the genocide in Myanmar. Knowing this requires us to reflect on what Voltaire and later Spider-Man's uncle said, which is that with great power comes great responsibility. 
we have serious global problems. A climate emergency, a decline in political rights and civil liberties, rampant poverty and inequality, and growing uncertainty in the face of the changing nature of work. These challenges are found in developing and developed countries alike. We all have something at stake, something to gain and a lot to lose if we don't take them seriously. Luckily, we have in this room uh, some of the best brains and creative talents, as well as some of the deepest pockets. So how can we channel this in a way that adds to tackling these issues? We need to take a step back and ask ourselves, what's my impact? How are the products and services I'm creating in education, science, politics, health and well-being tackling the, matter, the issues that matter globally? Words are not actions, however well-intentioned, and we cannot all be success stories. So we need to interrogate ourselves on whether we're really contributing and take action if we're not. Partnership is going to be key. It was the coming together of development partners and the private sector that led to the launch of M-Pesa in Kenya, bringing financial inclusion to 37 million users. But working on a good issue isn't enough. We also need to be thinking of the equity of our impact, which brings me to the second dimension of what are you adding? Adding for who? The benefits of digital transformation are not equally shared. Across low- and middle-income countries, for example, the gender divide in digital access and use stands at 23%, and in certain countries, it's higher still. A recent report calculated that closing that gender gap in those countries could add $700 billion to their GDP growth in five years. In short, thinking about inclusion isn't just about asking the private sector to dip into their CSR budgets. Put simply, a more inclusive society is a more prosperous one. Addressing these barriers to digital inclusion involves developing innovative new business models and making the most of new technologies. For example, in Pakistan, Recognizing the cultural barriers preventing some women from accessing online services, Sahat Kahani established itself as the first ever all-female online network of health practitioners, delivering quality healthcare to underserved communities through an e-health platform. Technology also has huge potential to improve accessibility. A collaboration between Mozilla and Germany's BMZ is developing an open speech recognition data set of local languages from across Africa and Asia to help develop a new ecosystem of voice-enabled products and technologies. It's an acknowledgement that for millions of people, the dominant languages of the internet and the tech industry are barriers to inclusion. And yet, the industry itself can play a role in tearing those boundaries down. If we're really going to turn things around, and shift the dial on inclusion, then we need to start asking ourselves, whose voices are we amplifying? Whose needs are we prioritizing? Whose data are we using? And who are we recruiting? Finally, it's about adding how. If we make our metric of success the, spe the scale and speed of disruption, we may very well end up meeting it, but at what cost? Back in the mid-1980s, historian Melvin Kranzberg said that tech is neither good nor bad, nor is it neutral. Several decades later, we have first-hand experience that it is rather how it is designed, developed and managed that give it impact. The good, the bad and the ugly. As we set mission statements, design platforms, develop products, we need to make sure we're consciously thinking of the world we want to create, the standards we wish to embed and the behaviours we want to encourage. I'm clearly addicted to my phone, as are many of you. But what's the bigger picture here? Lots of technology has been intentionally designed to be addictive. To hold our attention as their primary goal, regardless of the content and the consequences. Is this ethical? Is this the society we want to build and the way in which we want the human experience to evolve? I was recently inspired to learn about the case of Taiwan's digital minister, who's had early success with a platform to improve how governments respond to citizens' views and needs. Polis, as the platform is called, has been deliberately designed to foster consensus and avoid typically divisive online interactions. This means no reply button, reducing trolls. 
no echo chambers, instead an attitudes map showing you where you are in relation to others' views and where statements that garner the most agreement, not just within, but across groups, get the most visibility. They have demonstrated that the design options exist to shift our behavior online for the better if we wish to pursue them. Since that conversation with Steffi, I've continued to reflect on the what, for who, and how of adding value in my own work. It's led me to my new role on digital transformation of government internationally. Digital public service provision puts those questions at its core, asking what issues matter most to citizens? How do you design for those that are hardest to reach? And how can we build in principles of user rights, privacy, and data ethics from the start? So, let me kick things off by setting us all a challenge. To spend the next few days thinking through how in our own ways and across all three dimensions, we can meaningfully add. Whether it's on what you decide to focus your next idea, who you decide to include, or how you decide to design and operate, just pause for a moment and think, what am I adding? Thank you.